This book is off to a tremendous start, as well it should be. Um, when Michelle first proposed this book to us a number of years ago, um, everyone at the editorial meeting where the proposal was discussed agreed that it was the single best proposal we had seen in at least a decade. Um, Michelle is an awesome thinker. She is brilliant and she is um, uh, ex very exacting. She holds the bar incredibly high, which is probably why she produced three children in the time it took her to produce this book. <laughs> I just had to say that. It's such a great fun fact. The first printing of the book has sold out. There are exactly 26 copies here, and there are more than 26 of you. I don't want to cause a stampede. <laughs> Um, but these are some of the few copies in New York, so get yours while you can. Uh, Mobile Libris is here selling tonight, and we're grateful for, to them for doing that. If we do run out, they have order forms, and you can order the book, and they will send it to you free shipping uh, as soon as it comes back in. Uh, Michelle has been doing civil rights work for a very long time. Uh, she, I first came across her work when she was a Soros uh, Justice Fellow um, at the Open Society Institute. Um, she is now at Ohio State Law School where she has a joint apport, appointment with the Kiron Institute. Uh, before that, she was at the ACLU of Northern California running their uh, uh, racial justice initiative. She clerked for a Supreme Court justice, if I have that right. Do I have that right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, kind of a slouch, but what can you do? Um, and with that, I give you Michelle Alexander. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for the very warm and generous introductions. I want to thank Demos and the ACLU and the Metropolitan Black Bar Association. Um, you know, it's just really an honor to be here. Um, well, let me acknowledge at the outset um, that the argument that I'm going to make tonight and that I make in my book is hard for a lot of folks to swallow, um, particularly if you yourself have never spent time in prison or have been labeled a felon. But here's the claim that I make in the book and spend nearly 300 pages proving with voluminous data, evidence, and testimony. Uh, today, in the so-called era of colorblindness, something akin to a racial caste system exists in America. Um, this is not the cheerful, optimistic message you'll hear at most Black History Month gatherings that are still trumpeting the election of <coughs> Barack Obama. But it is, I believe, the truth, a truth that we as a nation have gone to great lengths to deny, or perhaps it's more accurate to say to avoid knowing. Um, for those of you who might be tempted to dismiss this type of claim out of hand, you know, I just encourage you to keep an open mind. Um, I myself dismiss this claim more than a decade ago, a fact I now regret. Um, as I discuss in the introduction um, to my book, I first encountered the idea of a new racial caste system um, more than a decade ago when a bright orange poster caught my eye. I was rushing to catch the bus in Oakland and I saw this bright orange poster stapled to a telephone pole and on it, it said, the drug war is the new Jim Crow. And I stopped for a minute and kind of scanned the text of the flyer and I saw that, you know, a radical community group was holding a meeting in a local church just a few blocks away and they were going to be organizing to protest the new three strikes law in California, the expansion of the prison system and police brutality. And I remember, you know, thinking to myself, yeah, you know, the criminal justice system is racist in a lot of ways, but it doesn't help to make such absurd comparisons. You know, people just think you're crazy. You know, and then I crossed the street and hopped on the bus on my way to my new job as director of the Racial Justice Project at the ACLU. Well, when I began my work at the ACLU, you know, I assumed that the criminal justice system had problems of racial bias much in the same way, you know, all institutions in our society are infected with conscious and unconscious bias. You know, as a civil rights lawyer, I had worked on employment discrimination cases where, you know, racial stereotyping, racial bias, uh, 
permeates subjective decision making at all levels of institutions and I saw you know the devastating consequences of institutional <coughs> discrimination um, so when I went to the ACLU you know I shifted my focus from employment discrimination to criminal justice reform and kind of dedicated myself to the task of rooting out you know, racial bias wherever and whenever it would rear its ugly head in the criminal justice system. But by the time I left the ACLU, you know, I had come to believe that I was wrong about the criminal justice system. It was not just another institution infected with racial bias, but a different beast entirely. You know, the activists who post the sign on the telephone pole <coughs> were not crazy, nor were the smattering of lawyers and activists around the country that were beginning to connect the dots between mass incarceration and earlier forms of racial control. So quite belatedly, really, I came to see that mass incarceration in the United States has come to function as a stunningly comprehensive and well-disguised system of social control analogous to Jim Crow. I state on page two of the introduction, what has changed since the collapse of Jim Crow has less to do with the basic structure of our society than the language we use to justify it. In the era of colorblindness, it is no longer socially permissible to use race explicitly as a justification for discrimination, exclusion, and social contempt. So we don't. Rather than rely on race, we use our criminal justice system to label people of color criminals and then engage in all the practices we supposedly left behind. Today, it is perfectly legal to discriminate against criminals in nearly all the ways it was once legal to discriminate against African Americans. Once you're labeled a felon, all the old forms of discrimination, housing discrimination, employment discrimination, denial of the right to vote, exclusion from jury service, are suddenly legal. You know, as a criminal, you scarcely have more rights and arguably less respect. <laughs> Not sure. You're being censored. I guess so. It is a conspiracy. <laughs> As a criminal, you scarcely have more rights and arguably less respect than a black man living in Alabama at the height of Jim Crow. We have not ended racial caste in America. We have merely redesigned it. Well, here are some facts I uncovered in the course of my research um, for writing this book that you probably you know, haven't heard on the evening news. More African Americans are under correctional control today, in prison or jail, on probation or parole, than were enslaved in 1850, a decade before the Civil War began. As of 2004, more black men were disenfranchised due to felon disenfranchisement laws than in 1870, the year the 15th Amendment was ratified prohibiting laws that explicitly deny the right to vote on the basis of race. In some major American cities, like Chicago, more than half of working age African American men have criminal records and are thus subject to legalized discrimination for the rest of their lives. These men are part of a growing undercast, not class, caste. They are permanently locked into an inferior second class status by law and custom, much like their grandparents or their great grandparents may have been during Jim Crow. You know, I find that when I tell people you know, that I think mass incarceration amounts to a new Jim Crow, you know, I'm frequently met with you know, shock disbelief. People say, what? You know, how can you say that? Just look at Barack Obama. You know, just look at Oprah Winfrey. You know? <laughs> but the fact that some African Americans have experienced great success in recent years does not mean that something akin to a racial caste system no longer exists. No caste system in the United States has ever governed all African Americans. There have always been free blacks and black success stories, even during slavery, in Jim Crow. You know, the superlative nature of individual black achievement today suggests that the old Jim Crow system is dead, 
but it doesn't necessarily mean the end of racial caste. You know, if history is any guide, it may have just taken a different form. You know, any candid observer of American history, I think, has to acknowledge that the rules and reasons the legal system employs for enforcing status relations of any kind, they evolve and they change as they're challenged. You know, in the first chapter of the book, I describe in some de detail kind of the cyclical rebirths of racial caste in America. You know, African Americans have repeatedly been controlled through institutions like slavery and Jim Crow that appear to die, but then are reborn in new form tailored to the needs and constraints of the time. Jim Crow replaced slavery. Mass incarceration, I believe, has replaced Jim Crow. The emergence of this new system of control really has been just sudden and dramatic. Um, in less than 30 years, the US penal population went from about 300,000 to more than 2 million, quintupled, right? The United States now has the highest rate of incarceration in the world dwarfing the rates of even highly repressive regimes like China and Iran. In fact, if we as a nation were to return to the rate of incarceration that we had back in the 1970s, you know, a time, by the way, that many civil rights activists thought that rates of incarceration were just egregiously high, if we were gonna return to the bad old days of the 1970s, we'd have to release four out of five people who are in prison today. More than a million people employed by the criminal justice system could lose their jobs. That's how enormous and entrenched this new system has become in an incredibly <coughs> short period of time. So what accounts for this you know, unprecedented expansion of our criminal justice system? You know, crime rates? You know, that's a popular answer, but no. Uh, Crime rates actually have remarkably little to do with skyrocketing incarceration rates. Crime rates have fluctuated over the past 30 years and today are actually at historical lows, but incarceration rates have consistently soared. You know, so what does explain this vast new system of control? Well, it turns out that the activists who post the sign on the telephone pole were right. The war on drugs, the drug war, is the single most important cause of the expansion of the prison system in the United States. Drug convictions account for about two thirds of the rise in the federal prison population and more than half of the increase in the state population. Drug convictions have, convi have increased by more than 1,000% since the drug war began. And for those who believe you know, that the drug war has been principally concerned with kind of rooting out drug kingpins or violent offenders, well, you should think again. Four out of five drug convictions are for possession, only one out of five for sales. Most people in state prison for drug offenses today have no, I repeat, no history of violence or significant selling activity. In fact, in the 1990s, the period of the most dramatic expansion of the drug war, marijuana possession convictions accounted for nearly 80% of the increase. Marijuana possession, marijuana, a drug less harmful than alcohol or tobacco, and marijuana possession is a crime that is most certainly committed as much by whites, middle class whites, as it is by poor African Americans. But the drug war has been waged almost exclusively in poor communities of color. Studies have consistently shown now for decades that people of color are no more likely to use or sell illegal drugs than whites. Now that defies kind of our usual thinking about who a drug dealer is. We think typically of, you know, a black kid standing on a street corner with his pants sagging down. Well, plenty of drug dealing happens in the ghetto, but it happens everywhere else in America as well. The drug market in America is highly segregated by race, much like our society is. Blacks tend to sell to whites, whites tend to sell to each other, Latinos tend to sell to each other, university students sell to each other. Drug dealing happens everywhere in America. In fact, most Americans violate drug laws at some point in their lifetime. But relatively few white people ever do time for drug offenses. Those who do time for drug crime in the United States are overwhelmingly black and brown. 
In fact, in some states, African Americans alone have, count, have accounted for 80 to 90 percent of all drug convictions. The U.S. Supreme Court, you know, for its part, has mostly turned a blind eye to race discrimination in the criminal justice system. Um, I describe in you know, some detail in chapter three that the court has closed the courthouse doors to claims of racial bias in the criminal justice system at every stage of the criminal justice process, from stops and searches to plea bargaining to sentencing. In a series of cases, beginning with McCleskey versus Kemp and Armstrong versus United States, the Supreme Court basically said that the courthouse is closed to claims of racial bias in the criminal justice system in the absence of explicit evidence of conscious discriminatory intent. Now what that means in the era of colorblindness, of course, is that unless someone admits it, you don't have a case. No matter how great the statistical evidence, no matter how severe the racial disparities, unless someone admits to their bias, the courthouse doors are closed. Well, I want to talk for just a few minutes about some of the parallels between um, Jim Crow and mass incarceration and then, you know, get to some of your questions. But ask yourself, you know, whether these rules and laws that apply to those who have been labeled felons, and many of the folks who have been labeled felons, black and brown folks, are labeled at very young ages. Ask, you, ask yourself whether they remind you of a bygone era. You know, first, Denial of the right to vote. 47 states in the District of Columbia, prisoners are denied the right to vote, but of course that's just the tip of the iceberg because once you're released from prison, um, states may deny you the right to vote for a period of years or your entire life. Nationwide, nearly one in seven black men are either temporarily or permanently disenfranchised as a result of felon disenfranchisement laws. Employment discrimination. Employment discrimination is perfectly legal you've been labeled a felon. In one survey, about 70% of employers said that they wouldn't even consider, wouldn't even consider hiring a drug felon. Applications ranging from jobs, you know, from Burger King clerk to accountant routinely ask whether you've been convicted of a felony. States deny professional licenses to hundreds of categories of occupations um, based on felony status. In some states, you can't even be a barber if you've been labeled a felon. <clears throat> housing discrimination is perfectly legal. Public housing projects as well as private landlords are free to discriminate and in fact, if you've been labeled a felon, you are barred from public housing for a minimum of five years. So here you are, released from prison, no money, no job, nowhere to go. Public housing is off limits to you for a minimum of five years. What are, what are former prisoners expected to go? Well, one thing they're expected to do is pay a lot of fees, fines, and court costs. You know, following the collapse of slavery, black men were routinely arrested for very minor crimes like vagrancy or loitering. Um, they were arrested, imprisoned, and then forced to work on plantations. They were shipped out, hired out to plantations. They supposedly had to earn their freedom, right? But the catch was, um, that they could never earn enough to pay the costs um, of their food and their care. And so many remained virtually enslaved for life. Well, today, a similar system exists. Um, even if a former prisoner manages to get a job, you know, is lucky enough to actually land a job, up to 100% of their wages can be garnished to pay the costs, to pay back the costs of their imprisonment to pay court processing costs and fees and accumulated child support. So, you know, what realistically do we expect these folks to do? What is the system designed to do? It's designed to return them back to prison. And in fact, that's what happened. Well, that's what happens. Um, nearly 70% of released prisoners um, return to prison within three years. Public benefits. Discrimination is perfectly legal in public benefits. In fact, if you're a drug felon, you're deemed ineligible for food stamps for the rest of your life. Pregnant women, people with HIV or AIDS, tough luck. No food stamps, no matter if you're ill, poverty-stricken, and hungry. 
Jury service. One hallmark, of course, of the Jim Crow era was kind of the all-white jury, you know, particularly in the South. Well, today, those labeled felons automatically excluded from juries, considered ineligible for jury service. Um, the all-white jury has come roaring back in many areas of the country, in large part because felons are deemed ineligible for jury service. And even if you haven't yet been labeled a felon, if you've had negative experiences with law enforcement, you're presumed biased and incapable of rendering a fair and impartial judgment in a criminal case, excluded from jury service. But you know, as bad as all these formal, you know, political and you know, and economic forms of exclusion are, in my experience, those who have been labeled felons say that the worst of it is the stigma. You know, it's not just the denial of the job, but the look that flashes across an employer's face when he notices the box has been checked. You know, it's not just the denial of housing but having to beg your grandma for a place to sleep at night because nowhere will take you in. You know, the shame associated with criminality today is so intense that people routinely try to pass, right? You know, during the Jim Crow era, light-skinned blacks, you know, often tried to avoid the stigma, shame, and uh, pervasive discrimination um, by trying to pass as white. Well, today, those labeled felons try to pass by lying not only to employers and housing officials, but also to friends, to family members, to coworkers, to relatives. You know, an excellent ethnographic study that was conducted by a Georgetown law professor um, in DC found that even in the neighborhoods, you know, hardest hit by mass incarceration, you know, neighborhoods where, you know, every house or every other house had a family member who was either behind bars or recently released from prison. Even in these neighborhoods where you think that, you know, incarceration of folks would just be thought to be normal. Even in those neighborhoods, not one of the people who was interviewed had fully come out to their friends, family, and loved one about their own criminal history or the status of their loved ones. An eerie kind of silence has fallen over. Um, many communities, even hardest hit by mass incarceration, um, a silence rooted for some in denial um, and for others in shame. So I want to talk for a minute about denial. Um, you know, there's two major reasons, I think, that so many of us are in denial about racial caste in America. Um, the first is traceable to a profound misunderstanding about how racial oppression actually works. Um, if someone were to visit the US from another country or another planet and say, you know, is the criminal justice system some kind of tool of racial control? You know, most Americans would just swiftly deny it. They'd say, no, you know, bad schools, black culture, poverty is to blame. You know, the system isn't run by a bunch of racists, it's run by people who are trying to fight crime. You know, because mass incarceration is officially colorblind, and because most Americans don't think of themselves as racist, it seems inconceivable um, that a system like this could function in a racially biased manner. But more than 45 years ago, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. warned of precisely this kind of thinking. You know, he insisted time and time again that blindness and indifference to racial groups is actually more important than racial hostility to the creation and maintenance of racial caste systems. And he said those who supported slavery and Jim Crow, you know, typically they were not bad or evil people. They were just blind. Um, many segregationists, you know, he would often point out, they were kind to their black maids and black shoe shiners. They genuinely wished them well. You know, even the justices um, who decided the infamous Dred Scott case, you know, the case where the Supreme Court ruled that, you know, the black man has no rights, which the white man is bound to respect. You know, Dr. King said, even they, they were decent and honorable men, but they were inflicted with a terrible blindness. Um, he said the whole system of slavery was largely perpetrated through spiritually and ignorant persons. 
spiritually ignorant persons. Well, I would argue the same is true today. You know, people of goodwill and bad have been unwilling to see black and brown men in their humanness, you know, entitled to the same care and compassion, concern that we'd extend to our friends or loved ones. I mean, really, who among us, who among us would wish for someone we cared about who was caught with drugs to be put in a cage, branded a felon, and then subject to a lifetime of discrimination, scorn, and social inclusion, exclusion. Who, who would wish that upon anyone you actually cared about? Well, Dr. King recognized that it's this callous racial indifference, the indifference to the suffering of people of other races, that is the foundation of all racial caste systems. Well, another reason that I think we remain in deep denial is that we as a nation have a false picture of our racial reality. You know, prisoners are literally erased from our economic picture. Um, unemployment and poverty statistics don't count. People behind bars, it's as though they don't exist. Uh, in fact, standard unemployment reports underestimate the amount of black joblessness black male joblessness by as much as 24 percentage points. So when you read kind of the unemployment rate for black men, you know, or African Americans, you can just add to that figure, you know, 15 to 20 percentage points if you want to take into account the people who are warehoused behind bars. Um, even during the 1990s, you know, the much heralded, you know, economic boom of the Clinton years, African American men were the only group that experienced a steep increase in joblessness, a development directly traceable to their rapid inclusion in the criminal justice system. You know, during the 1990s, kind of the best of times for the rest of America, the unemployment rate for non-college black men was 42%. Affirmative action, though, has kind of put a happy face on this racial reality. You know, seeing black people graduate from Harvard and Yale and become CEOs, corporate lawyers, not to mention president of the United States, you know, it kind of causes us all to marvel, like, oh, what a long way we have come. But recent data shows that much of black progress is actually a myth. In many respects, African Americans as a group are doing no better off than when Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated and uprisings swept inner city communities across America. The black poverty rate today is about the same as it was back then. Nearly one quarter of African Americans live below the poverty line today. The black child poverty rate is actually higher today than it was in 1968. And unemployment rates in the African American community, they, they rival those in third world countries. Right? And that's with affirmative action. So when we kind of pull back the curtain and take a look at what our so-called colorblind society creates without affirmative action, I think what we see is a familiar social, economic, and political structure. It's the structure of racial caste. And the entrance into this new caste system, I believe, can be found at the prison gate. So what do we do? <laughs> you know, where do we go from here? Um, I spend the last chapter of my book exploring this question in some depth. Um, what's clear, I think, though, is that those of us in the civil rights community, we've allowed a human rights nightmare to occur on our watch. You know, while many of us have been defending affirmative action and trying to hold on to the gains of the past, millions, millions of people have been rounded up for relatively minor crimes, branded felons, and then released into a parallel social universe in which they are denied the same rights that our parents and grandparents fought for and some died for. That's the reality. You know, what is needed, I believe, today is a broad-based social movement one that rivals in size, scope, depth, and courage the one that was begun in the 1960s and left unfinished. <laughs>
You know, it must be a multiracial, multi-ethnic movement that includes poor whites, a group that is often pitted against people of color, triggering the rise of successive new systems of control. But before, you know, such a movement can get started, you know, a great awakening is required. You know, we've got to awaken from this colorblind slumber we're in to the realities of race in America. Um, and we've got to be willing to embrace those who have been labeled criminals. Truly embrace them. Not necessarily all their behavior, but them. Because it's been the failure to recognize the dignity, and the humanity, and the basic worth of every human being that has given rise to every racial caste system that has existed in the United States or anywhere else in the world. So I think it's our task, really, to end not just mass incarceration, but the history of, mass, of, of racial caste in America. So thanks very much. I'd be happy to take it. Questions? Thoughts? Yeah? I'm dealing on a day to day, and I feel that in a, in a big part, I'm adding to the problem, you know, because I'm basically working out dispositions on a day to day. I'm not taking very many cases to trial. I see most of my clients are black and Latino. Well, I think that there's a lot that public defenders can actually do, you know, and I understand how you can feel demoralized and discouraged seeing one case after another and watching, you know, young folks of color being locked up um, and then relegated. <laughs> you, know, you know what life holds for them after they've been branded a felon. Um, but one of the most important things I think you can do is to help reduce the shame and stigma that they experience as a result of being processed through the criminal justice system and also help their families and those who are involved in these cases understand that what's happening to them is part of something much larger. And they don't have to be passive in this process, that they can actually play an active role in resistance. And it may not feel as though they have any power when they're standing in shackles in a courtroom and a sentence is being handed down, but in fact they do. And there are prisoners, you know, across America who are beginning to organize around these issues. There are folks who, once they're released, are joining organizations like All of Us Are None, organizations of formerly incarcerated people who are organizing for their civil and human rights. And so you can begin to help connect these folks with organizations who can provide support, encouragement, and, you know, open the door to kind of, instead of just passive resignation, to active engagement and resistance. The other thing I think public defender agencies can do as a whole is begin to take account of what are all the collateral consequences of a felony conviction. You know, defendants aren't advised when they plead guilty, <laughs> um, as most defendants are, you know, encouraged to do, just plead, plead out, just take with a little amount of time that, you know, is offered to you, just plead out. Well, when you plead to a felony, you're not just pleading to that time, you're also agreeing to a whole host of forms of discrimination they may not know about. So doing the research and knowing what are all the forms of discrimination that they may face and that they may think they face that they don't. In some states, of course, you don't lose your right to vote, but many people assume that they do. Um, and in Ohio, for example, there's a coalition of groups that are coming together to keep track of all the forms of, you know, what's frequently referred to as kind of collateral consequences of uh, convictions, keep track of them and begin working with, you know, folks who are incarcerated and their families to begin advocating and legislatures to get rid of these forms of discrimination kind of one by one. Um, so I think you serve an important bridge function right, between kind of the world of advocacy and those who are most directly impacted by the system of control. Uh, many of the numbers that you were giving us were suggesting that, what, 60, 80 percent of the con drug, uh, are drug convictions that cause the felony to, uh, to be foisted on someone. So the question is, well, two questions actually. One is, do you think that, in fact, the drug laws are designed specifically to do what they are doing? Or is it simply um, a bias within the enforcement world that makes them decide that they are going to enforce the drug laws um, 
unfairly on um, people of color? That's the first question. And the second one is, wouldn't the solution to the problem be take away that possibility of uh, criminalizing people who use uh, pot by legalizing it? Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be, would you agree that that was a way to work with the system or would they just find something else to uh, incarcerate African Americans with? Well, you know, I think it's important. I spent a lot of time talking in the book to understand the history of where the drug war came from. Um, you know, most people assume that the war on drugs was launched in response to the emergence of crack cocaine in inner city communities. That's just false. You know, actually, the drug war was launched a couple of years before crack hit the streets and became, you know, kind of captured public attention in the media. Um, the drug war was motivated by racial politics, not drug crime. Um, it was part of kind of a broader project that the Republican Party was engaged in then, you know, the so-called Southern strategy to try to appeal to poor and working class whites who were um, resentful of and threatened by desegregation, busing, and affirmative action. Um, poor and working class whites who were once solidly part of the New Deal, Democratic New Deal coalition, but who kind of the Reagan, um, um, the Reagan administration realized could be won over to the Republican Party through kind of not so subtle racial appeals on issues around crime and welfare. So the drug war was launched as a way of trying to appeal to poor and working class white voters saying we're going to get tough on them, put them back in their place. Um, and them was not so subtly defined as African Americans. Um, when crack emerged, you know, a few years later, you know, the Reagan administration responded with glee. You know, they seized on the emergence of crack cocaine in inner city communities as an opportunity to build public support for the war. They actually hired staff um, to run a media campaign to publicize crack babies and crack <laughs> dealers, um, crack mothers in inner city communities, and almost overnight, you know, images of black, black you know, crack dealers and users just saturated the media and kind of forever changed our conception of who drug users and dealers are. Um, so I guess the short answer to your question is yes, there was racial motivation <laughs> for the launching of the drug war, um, but the racial motivation wasn't simply just to kind of harm African Americans. The motivation was to win over poor and working class white voters through implicit racial appeals. Just as slavery wasn't motivated by a purely sadistic desire to harm black people, it was motivated by greed, a desire to make money off of plantations. Race was the tool that was used to achieve that goal. Here, the drug war wasn't motivated solely by race, but race was the vehicle for them to achieve their political goals. And once the media imagery um, kind of saturated the news, the enemy in the war was racially defined. Law enforcement understood kind of who they were looking for. And I think the reality also is that there's no way law enforcement agencies could get away with anything remotely similar to the drug war in middle class white communities. You know, they use SWAT teams to execute routine narcotics warrants in these communities, um, you know, busting down doors, you know, frightening um, folks, terrorizing people in pursuit of the drug war, this kind of practices would never have gone over um, in middle class white communities. It's because those folks are marginalized and politically powerless that it has been convenient um, to wage a drug war in those communities um, primarily. Um, as for legalization of drugs, well, yeah, I think you know, we should seriously consider um, legalizing some drugs in the United States. But I think it's important to recognize that we don't have to even legalize drugs to go back to what we were doing in the 1970s before we were waging an all-out war on poor communities of color. Um, and I think that there is a little bit of a temptation today um, because people have come to see that the drug war is a failure and that many of the justifications that have been offered for, you know, making marijuana illegal, for example, don't actually hold up to scientific scrutiny. Well, there's been a temptation to try to pursue kind of a colorblind approach 
and just argue for drug legalization as a way of mitigating the harms associated with mass incarceration. But I think that's a huge mistake. Um, yes, we can talk about drug legalization, but we need to talk about the reason a drug war has been waged um, and really reckon with the role race has played in the emergence of this new system of control and how it's been, how it's been waged. If we don't reckon with that history, I do think that we're doomed to repeat it in some other form. Perhaps a new system of control we can't foresee will emerge just as mass incarceration was utterly unforeseeable just 30 years ago. Yeah. Uh, with, with that backdrop of information and the um, recent statistics, I guess, um, from the New York Times and other papers about the uh, stop and frisk procedures used by NYPD and the fact that I believe it's 87% of the 570,000 persons were minority, and I think 94% of the actual stops did not result in an arrest, which made it 6% successful, I guess. Uh, with that backdrop, and this may be a weird question, but I'll ask it anyway. What, if any, is the role of an African-American prosecutor or African-American judge with that backdrop, knowing that there's a failed uh, drug policy, there's a wholesale grabbing up of minorities, there's a caste system in the jail system, and we know now that 87% of your stops are for nothing, or well, 94% of your stops are for nothing. What do you think, if there is a specific role uh, for African-American prosecutors and African-American criminal judges? Well, as you may know, um um, a friend of mine, Paul Butler, who has recently published a book called A Hip Hop Theory of Criminal Justice, has argued that good people should not be prosecutors. Good people should not be prosecutors given the nature of the system, um, that there is so little opportunity um, to make a positive difference in so much damage that is done with the system as it's currently de designed that good people cannot be prosecutors. I don't know if that's true, but what I do know is that you need a lot of courage if you're going to be an effective prosecutor. And what I mean by effective, I mean a just and fair prosecutor in a system that has been designed really to incarcerate in mass poor folks of color. Um, it's going to take a lot of courage, more courage than I think most folks have. Because what it requires is constantly resisting um, all of the institutional structures and incentives that are designed to reward getting tough um, and cracking down on the bad guy as opposed to giving second chances, letting folks go, you know, charging with misdemeanors rather than felonies. There's a lot of things that prosecutors can do to mitigate the harm of the system, um, but it takes a lot of courage, and there won't be many folks in your office that are supportive of what you're doing. Um, so I think folks who are interested in being prosecutors have to ask themselves, you know, what is my tolerance level um, for, you know, facing a lot of disapproval within my office. And I think most lawyers are accustomed to, you know, seeking institutional rewards. They did well in school. They like to be patted on the head for doing a good job and um, making great arguments. And the question is, are you willing to be fired? Are you willing um, to make arguments to your boss um, and to law enforcement officers and DE agents who you'll be working with that they won't like? Um, if you're willing to do that, then I say, yes, there may well be an important role for you. Um, but if you lack that kind of courage, then I think you may legitimate the system far more than you undermine it. Um, yeah. Does your book address what happens inside the correctional facilities? Do I don't spend a lot of time talking about life behind bars. Um, I do spend a little bit of time talking about the fact that, you know, of course, corporations today now use prison labor, um, you know, to avoid paying minimum wage and providing benefits to workers and that prisons in many respects now 
provide kind of the economic base for many, you know, predominantly white rural communities that plantations once provided. Um, but do I talk about life in prison? And no, not much. No. Um, about the uh, movement that we need to build and couple of things I thought you might reflect on in particular, since you mentioned affirmative action, I'm really struck by how much more um, uh, public attention there seems to be to the affirmative action fights um, and movement attention um, to that end of things than there is to uh, um, changing the incarceration system. And on from an alliance point of view, um, uh, poor whites, immigrants, um, you know, building a multiracial kind of movement. Um, I'm wondering about examples or um, troubles that you've seen people, uh, it's just not an easy thing to do. So um, any insight you have into folks who are moving something uh, that we can learn from or um, priorities, shifts in priorities in, in our movement work, uh, that would be great to hear about. So much um, attention has been paid to affirmative action by civil rights organizations. Um, and there's a number of reasons for my concern. I mean, first of all, I should say, I'm an affirmative action baby. <laughs> I'm very grateful for the opportunities that I've had. And in many respects, you know, I feel like I'm a poster child for affirmative action. You know, in the course of my work, I began you know, with families whose lives have been really shattered by the impact of mass incarceration as I began to appreciate more and more the ways in which the drug war and our policies of mass incarceration have radically altered the life course of millions, <laughs> millions of people, I began to kind of rethink um, the amount of attention and resources that have been paid to affirmative action at a time that this new caste system has emerged. And I'm worried um, that the affirmative action debate has distracted our attention, um, that we've taken our eye off the ball, so to speak, to, to a large degree, um, and that while we've been obsessed over kind of whether who's going to get to go to Harvard or Yale, um, that really this human rights nightmare has been occurring on our watch. And I'm also concerned about the way in which affirmative action masks the severity of racial inequality in the United States. It masks it, it makes things look good on the surface without any changes in the fundamental structure of our society. Now, you know, if we were building a movement that meaningfully addressed those structural changes at the same time that we were fighting for affirmative action. You know, I think a case could be made, well, we can do both at the same time. Well, we haven't done both at the same time. <laughs> we haven't built a movement to end mass incarceration haven't built a movement for educational equity. We actually haven't succeeded in building a movement. That mo those movements, real movement building work, ended <laughs> back in the 60s. Um, and since we, we haven't been successful in building those movements, I think there are reasons to kind of ask. You know, should our attention have been channeled in another direction? I also think that affirmative action has helped to encourage this kind of trickle-down theory of racial justice. You know, this idea that if you just put black people in positions of power, that somehow kind of social change will trickle down. Um, and I think that theory of social change is just kind of belied by reality, you know? I think the history of social movements suggests that change happens most effectively most meaningfully and with the most lasting results when it happens from the ground up, from the bottom up. Um, so I think that we may have kind of encouraged, civil rights advocates have maybe encouraged people to buy into the idea that if only there's a black police chief, well then things will be different. Well what we need to do is integrate the police force. If we ensure through affirmative action that there's more black officers that will help to solve racial profiling. Well, not so much. Not so much. 
The reality is that the structures, the racial structures of our society, if they aren't changed, sprinkling people of color in those institutions isn't going to get it. Um, so I do think that there's reason for concern um, about the role affirmative action has played in the public debate and the amount of attention and resources that have been devoted to it. And I think that the hard work of building that multi-ethnic, multi-racial kind of movement that is necessary, not just to end mass incarceration, but rather to kind of achieve the dream <laughs> that King had back then, um, you know, there's no easy roadmap for that. Um, but I do think that the shift from a civil rights movement to a human rights movement, a shift that Malcolm X called for, you know, in his final days that, you know, the SNCC leaders were calling for back in the day that we need to stop talking about civil rights and start talking about human rights, that that shift is long overdue. Um, and that, you know, we really need to begin a public discourse and, you know, aggressive advocacy around ensuring basic human rights, the right to work, the right to adequate education, the right to health care, kind of the whole gamut. Um, it is rooted in the notion that we are all entitled as humans to these economic and social rights. We're not just entitled to the right to vote again and again <laughs> for the same political actors who failed to deliver because they're bought. So we have to take responsibility for the movement building at the bottom up, and I think it should be rooted in a notion of human rights, not just civil rights. Um, in reference to the pervasive public ignorance to this contemporary form of racial social control. Um, what role do you think that the persistence of widespread myths uh, play in maintaining the system? And I think of particularly the, the persistent misconception that there's a significant difference between powder and crack cocaine in the mandatory minimum sentencing. Yeah, well, I think that there's that myth out there, um, you know, that crack is far more dangerous or destructive than powder cocaine and that that may justify, you know, this 100 to 1 sentencing disparity between crack and powder cocaine. But, you know, at least in policy circles, you know, those, those myths have been debunked and they've been debunked for a long time <laughs> now. Um, and, you know, I, I think that um, when we take a look at kind of, again, the origins <laughs> of, of these disparities, Yes, there was kind of a frenzy associated with crack cocaine and a lot of horror stories associated with crack cocaine at a time that these laws were passed. Um, but there was also a tremendous amount of racial resentment and hostility that was being unleashed through these implicitly racial political appeals. Um, so I'm not so sure that really the most important thing that needs to be done is to kind of debunk myths about is crack really more harmful than powder and that sort of thing, but rather to challenge people to care as much, to care as much about, you know, the kids who are caught with crack cocaine as they do about the kids who are caught with powder cocaine. You know, kind of as I said earlier, no matter what drug you're caught with, if you care about that person, your answer isn't a cage and a lifetime of social exclusion and discrimination. Um, so at bottom, I think it's really kind of that lack of care and concern across racial lines that's responsible for the crack versus powder cocaine disparity, even more so um, than myths about kind of the relative harm, um, harmfulness. Um, I'm not sure who's next. I think your hand up and up. I, <laughs> it's hard to keep track. We talk about the drug war coming out of the 1980s. Um, Later on, there's a drive to, to really uh, sort of bring the juvenile justice system into the criminal justice system to just sort of uh, to start uh, sentencing uh, juveniles as adults, et cetera. And now, uh, you know, the real drive to almost assert that immigrants have no rights, which citizens are bound to respect. I'm sort of at the point where is there, you know, one can there be yet another group, social group, that we are mass incarcerating? And two, uh, if so, who? There's a prison booming, a prison building boom going on for these kind of immigrant detention centers, um, particularly in the Southwest, which are typically run by private private corporations or 
very profitable. Um, and so, you know, also in you know states like California, the drug war has shifted from principally being concerned with African Americans to focusing primarily on Latinos. Um, so it's not just those who are thought to be you know, in the country illegally, but also those who are imagined to be drug dealers, Latinos have been a major target. And, you know, interesting data that was released by the Sentencing Project, you know, just a month or so ago, suggested that the first time since the drug war was launched that um, the rate of incarceration for whites is increasing at a time when the rate of incarceration for blacks for drug offenses has begun to decrease, which, you know, suggests to me that this is a hungry beast, <laughs> right? You know, that now that a lot of money can be made um, from incarceration and private prisons now see that a lot of money can be made from warehousing people, it's not just African Americans anymore that are the principal target of control. And while this is really bad news for all the people who are being targeted, it does create important opportunities for coalition building um, and for you know, people of you know, pretty drastically different life experiences and backgrounds to see the ways in which kind of they can be harmed by this, this system of control and have a real invested kind of interest um, in seeing it dismantled. Yeah. Uh, you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for raising this. I'm utterly surprised why the subject of mass incarceration, including and beyond the, the very important racial aspects, is treated so trivially in the United States. So few people are interested, and I have lots of friends who are liberals, attorneys, you know, and it just isn't an issue that concerns them. And yet we go prattling around the world about freedom, issuing human rights resource, uh, reports on countries like Iran. Or so. <laughs> it, it's insane. Thank you for your comments. Um, I don't know who's next. Go ahead. Through the things that I think would aid and abet the system of mass incarceration or mandatory minimums, um, the prison to the school to prison pipeline and the focus on incarceration versus rehabilitation for the majority of people, like you said, that are caught with drugs that under possession, thus being drug users. Do you think that reforming um, schools in especially low income? African American communities and folk and instead of incarceration, rehabilitation for drug users would help this at all. Um, I recently read a report from the University of Michigan, no, the University of Minnesota, saying that schools now are more racially segregated than ever before. Do I think that kind of a part of the answer to the problem of mass incarceration is kind of reforming our school systems? Well, yes, but you know I caution against kind of one line of thinking, and you know I often hear that. What we really need to do is fix our schools, because if we just fixed our schools, then so many kids of color wouldn't kind of find themselves marching off to the criminal, into the criminal justice system. Well, we've had bad schools in the African American community for a long, long time. Like, this isn't new, you know? Poverty, bad schools, unequal education, segregation, this stuff isn't new. Mass incarceration is new. The war on drugs is new. You know, lack of education, bad schooling doesn't cause incarceration. It doesn't cause it. If we chose not to round up young people, you know, by the hundreds of thousands for minor drug offenses, they wouldn't be in jail, right? They would still be in their bad schools, but they wouldn't be in jail, right? And so I think that we can do a lot to end the phenomenon of, kind of mass incarceration and the branding of young people and their relegation to second class status without changing the schools. Should we change the schools? Absolutely. Should we reform them? But I, I, I kind of caution against this thinking that, well, it's because they drop out of school or because the schools are bad or because the schools are segregated, that's why they're in jail. No, that's not why they're in jail. They're in jail because we declared a war on them. And we went in and we rounded them up for crimes that middle class kids, upper middle class kids commit all the time and don't get arrested and branded a felon for. Um, so I'm all for school reform, but I don't think that, you know, bad schools explain the phenomenon of mass incarceration. I'm sorry, I know we've beat this horse to the ground, but I want to just get back to the solutions portion of dealing with the Jim Crow 
legal system and the fact that, like I said, every day I see black and Latino men and women who get stopped and searched by NYPD without probable cause. And the, I guess the reality of the situation is a lot of the clients that I represent are deemed criminals. And society as a whole has kind of thrown them away. And they don't care about them because it's like, a, well, I don't have to worry about that because I live in Long Island. Mm-hmm. Or I don't have to worry about that because I'm an educated African. And that's, the, and that's how some people think. So in terms of trying to build this coalition that you're talking about, how do we get people to view the problem as a human problem and not something that, well, I don't have to worry about that because... That doesn't affect me. As an advocate, I had thought of my job as how do you persuade kind of those mainstream white voters to think differently? And much of advocacy has been geared towards, civil rights advocacy, I mean, has been geared towards how do we make that group of people think differently and care um, about our issues, our concerns, and our needs? Well, I think at this stage of movement building, uh, my own view is that The first order of business is how can we get our communities to care about each other, right? That the first order of business is consciousness raising and developing a sense of care, compassion, and concern within the communities most affected by it um, before we really even begin to address kind of those mainstream white swing voters that we're ultimately going to have to persuade through our advocacy work. And I say this in part because one of the things that you know, I've been really struck by in my own work on these issues is that, you know, with Jim Crow, African Americans were stigmatized, um, but they had their own businesses, you know, they had their own churches, theaters, workplaces. There was a sense of solidarity within the community. There was a, a degree of racial solidarity in community. Well, mass incarceration has turned the black community against itself, has turned communities of color against itself. And I think we first need to begin to build unity and a common understanding of the nature of this system and kind of an agreement about what must be done about it. You know, obviously there's not going to be perfect agreement or perfect consensus, but I think the first order of business is to raise consciousness in our own community that no, you know, the fact that all these kids are going to jail is not because they're just all hoodlums or bad kids. Right? It's because it's a setup. Their lives have been structured in such a way that guarantees their early admission into jail. And we need to begin to come together as a people and as a community um, to begin fighting um, for reform. I think it also means, like I said earlier, uh, trying to eliminate the stigma. You know, one of the things I thought was really interesting in some of this ethnographic research is the reluctance of so many people who have been labeled felons to admit it in church that many people who have been branded felons won't go to church anymore because they feel they're not wanted there, that churches are a place where kind of the good people are supposed to go, and they feel branded and not welcome. Well, churches should be kind of the first place (laughs) that people can come to get support and their families can find some measure of support. Um, And I think there needs to be some community building and consciousness raising that happens even before we direct our attention to kind of those so-called mainstream white swing voters. So right now in my own work, I'm really interested in what can be done among formerly incarcerated people, their family, families, um, the communities that are most impact- impacted around by mass incarceration to organize and build kind of strength and solidarity within those communities. What would you propose that the sentence be for someone who is accused of selling drugs and also in possession of a firearm when the purpose of the mandatory minimums when it comes to drugs and guns is to deter (coughs) that from happening and deter the violence from taking place? For example, we know with people that sell drugs and carry a firearm is eventually to use it to either shooting take place or a homicide take place since the Uh, the rise in violent crime is as a result of drugs being sold in those neighborhoods. So what sentence, if any, uh, would you recommend? Well, you know, I mean, I think if you're talking about a first-time offense for drug sales, you know, I have to say that my mind is very open to drug legalization. I have not, you know, there's a lot of research and conflicting arguments about, you know, whether drug legalization makes communities safer or less safe and all of that. 
I haven't explored all of that research, but my mind is very open. So, it's very open. And one thing is for sure is that, you know, research indicates that much of drug violence, drug-related violence in inner city communities is a result of drug markets being destabilized. That when you start arresting people and taking them off the street, then people fight to retain control of the drug markets and violence ensues. That some of the pe most peaceful drug markets to be found in the world are the ones that are left alone. Okay, so it's not clear to me that drug sales should be criminalized um, at all. But if it is criminalized, I think we can take a look at you know some of what our other the other countries in the world did. You know, in fact, in the United States, you know. There wasn't until the drug war, nobody went to jail for more than a year for um, a first time drug offense. Nobody. It was unheard of. In most countries in the world, even for drug dealing, you get maybe weeks or few months, not years. Um, so, you know, our perception of what's reasonable in terms of, you know, sentences for drug convictions, I think, is just grossly distorted by the war on drugs. And, you know, what's ironic, I think, is that, you know, back, in the 1970s, most criminologists, there was near consensus among criminologists that these theories of deterrence just didn't work. That the idea that you can deter somebody from committing a drug crime by telling them you're going to get five years rather than one, people don't make those kinds of calculations in, in, in making decisions about whether to use or sell drugs. So, um, you know, like I said, I think right now I'm more interested in kind of thinking about whether drugs should be legal at all. Um, and at a minimum, I think we should go back to doing things the way we did before the war on drugs was declared. And back then, the longest sentence anybody got for a drug offense was measured in months rather than years. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I agree with you about the, <laughs> how improving the quality of education by itself would not end the over-incarceration problem, but I'm wondering the extent to which you believe other practices like zero tolerance, um, over-criminalization, police in schools actually come from the exact same impulse that result in the drug problems, and how much does that mean, therefore, that the solution does involve taking a careful look at those policies at the school level? Yes. I agree completely, yes. I didn't mean to suggest that we shouldn't be concerned about what's happening in the schools at all, and I do think that the punitive impulse um, towards kids of color and urban schools stems from precisely kind of the same kinds of attitudes and inclinations that are found in the world. It's really just an extension <laughs> of the drug war into um, our inner city schools. So yes, I agree wholeheartedly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.